Dr. Michael Bruce, thank you for being here with me. Thanks for having me, dude. Of course. Happy to be here. I love talking about sleep because it's so important. So I had to get a bona fide expert such as yourself on the show to talk about it. Um, and you've also you've also brought to my attention some 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 terminology that I'm not all that familiar with, and so I want to mm -hmm. do a deep dive. Sure. Um, chronotypes. Got it. What is a chronotype? So it's interesting because people actually have not heard the term chronotype before, but most people really understand the concept. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever been called an early bird or a night owl before, is that ever come across your uh, your wavelengths before? Yeah, I've never been called an early bird. <laughs> okay, so, okay. <laughs> so, so that, now that we have that part clear, right? <laughs> so here's the thing is those are chronotypes. And so when we when you start to look at the medical literature about when we started to discover these things, um, scientifically, it was kind of in the 70s where people started with this idea of a questionnaire for morningness and eveningness. But to be clear, chronotypes have been around since like the dawn of time. Mm -hmm. So if you think about early, early villages, well, what, what was going on there? Well, there was a certain group of people that went out and hunted. Guess what? They were the early birds. Wow. Right? You know, and then there's a certain group of people that stayed around the village, you know, tended to the village, that kind of thing. They were what we call hummingbirds. And then there were people who was security or the sentries. Guess what? They were the night owls, right? So this isn't really a new concept. My contribution to the literature is, number one, we now understand that this is genetic. So you you can send me your 23andMe data, your Ancestry.com data, and I can actually show you on, on your genome exactly where the polymorphism is that creates this idea of being an early bird or a night owl. But what was also interesting was what I added was that there's an insomnia. There's a version of insomnia that, that seems to fall into this. And so I actually added a fourth chronotype. Now, to be fair, I didn't like them being named after birds. I'm a mammal. I'm not a bird. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, let's 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 figure out some animals, types that we can use. Now, you'll appreciate this. I'm um, having recently uh, released a book. Um, in the in the marketing of the book, right, we were all sitting around to think of, well, what are these animals going to be, right? Well, we discovered very early on, nobody wants to be a porcupine, right? <laughs> so, so we had to choose animals that were people were aspirational animals. But my biggest um, requirement was that, in fact, they had to maintain the circadian cycle that we were talking about. So an, an early bird, so we, what we discovered was lions are early birds, right? Their first kill is before dawn. We Historically, people know that wolves are night creatures, right? They hunt in the late evenings in the night. So lion for the early bird, wolf for the night owl became pretty obvious. And then in the middle were bears, right? Made sense, right? Bears kind of rise with the sun, go to sleep, you know, uh, as the moon comes out. But then it was, what do we do with these problem children, right? Mm. These insomnia kind of creatures. And so I chose dolphins. And so I, the reason I chose dolphins was because dolphins sleep unihemispherically. So half of their brain is asleep while the other half is awake and looking for predators, right? Because, you know, they're swimming in, in the water at the yeah. same time. And I thought that was kind of a unique representation of people who are never quite asleep. Right. And so what's really been fascinating is it's not just that these genetic traits make you wake up earlier or fall asleep um, earlier or later, or as the case may be, but it's a it's a roadmap for your entire hormonal set. Right. So that's where it gets kind of bizarre. So w with somebody who's a, an earlier person, what I call a lion, their melatonin basically turns off at like 5 a.m. Hmm. Right. But for somebody who's a wolf, a night owl like me, my melatonin doesn't want to turn off generally until like eight. Wow. So all of a sudden, somebody asking a night person to wake up at six becomes a really difficult thing to do. Right. And so all, then you start to say, well, what, what other hormones follow this circadian rhythmicity? All of them wow. do. So it's all very predictable, but it's going to be forwards or backwards depending upon this one area of early bird, night owl in the middle or insomniac. So all of a sudden the literature started to come together really quickly. And so we said, all right, well, we've kind of figured out the when to go to bed and when to wake up thing. What else What else could we figure out? Because people are always asking me, like, is there a perfect time of day to do certain things? Because if you get figured out sleep, what else could there be? And so I'm like, well, if we looked at hormones and we said, what hormones do you need for certain activities? If we know naturally when they're going to be at those, those times, because we know their chronotype, then that would be the best time of day for them to do these activities. Dude, the the science was ridiculous. We have over 220 studies in the book. I can tell you the best time of day to have sex, eat a cheeseburger, ask your boss for a raise. Like it's unbelievable. So, cause what we did was I have a bunch, you know, I have a bunch of my buddies. So I called them all up and I'm like, you guys aren't going to believe this. What are, tell me every activity that you do during the day. So I had them all, you know, 
writing down every activity for like two weeks and we had this culmination we had almost 100 activities we chose 50 that we thought m most people would be interested in and that's what's in the book so the book is you can take a quiz you can take it online uh, it's chronoquiz.com and um, you get your chronotype and then from there you can start to learn a whole host of different activities um, when to drink coffee when to exercise that kind of thing and it varies from person to person yeah it does it's amazing yeah there's really four big types and one one of the things that we've learned we've had over, over like, like one point four million people now have taken the quiz so we've had a decent number of folks roll through the metrics of it and what we've also discovered is there's one chronotype called a bear that's kind of the people in the middle what we used to call the hummingbirds they actually bifurcate so there are early bears and there are late bears is what we've kind of discovered wow um but like it's always interesting to me when you start to think about like self-help and when i'm trying to work on myself i'm trying to set these goals do these certain things in my life if I knew what the perfect time of my 24 hour cycle was to try to accomplish those tasks, I would have a leg up on that. Right. Yeah. 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 Like that would be like, I'm, I'm accelerating that process. Yeah. So true. And so what are the, so you mentioned, you talked about melatonin. What are some of the other hormones that are, that are differentially modulated by these different chromoty chronotypes? Cortisol, <laughs> like the biggie in all anti inflammatory, you know, discussions. Um, like uh, interleukin uh, six. I mean, like, dude, literally every single hormone wow. is, is altered in terms of when it is produced based on these chronotypes. Talk about cortisol, because a lot of people think about cortisol sort of as being this like blanket negative hormone right. because of its association with chronic stress. Right. But cortisol is not bad, right? God, no. Cortisol is awesome, dude. If we didn't have cortisol, we wouldn't be able to wake up. Right. So in order to pull a body and a brain out of a state of unconsciousness, you need two hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. And they have to be pretty much up there in order because remember, REM sleep has a tendency to occur in the latter part of the night. That's where the bulk of your REM sleep is. You have a little bit in each cycle, but the back half is where you get the most of it. That's really arguably one of the deepest stages of sleep. In order to pull the brain out of that for, you know, wake up for your day when it is the most likely thing stage you're going to be in, you need something that's got some giddy up in it. Mm. And cortisol and adrenaline are those things. So cortisol is very helpful. Um, cortisol is also helpful for any time that you need uh, significant movement in a short, you know, in a rapid pace, right? So if you're running or fear, um, all of those things, trust me, if you didn't have cortisol, we'd all be dead. <laughs> yeah, we'd all, we'd all be in big trouble. So is this why people with a, like when people have to, you know, attenuate their sleep for whatever reason. They wake mm -hmm. up due to an alarm clock to get to right. work. They feel miserable yes. just because they've cut off that latter part of the sleep. Absolutely, because again, their cycle is going to be based on their chronotype, and so it just it becomes more and more difficult for people. Like like you know, you've heard this whole idea of the five a.m. club, right? Like people are like you're going to wake up at you know Richard Branson gets up at five a.m. Like that's awesome for him, but I'm here to tell you, genetically speaking, not preference, just pure genetics here you're you're talking maybe maybe 25 to 30 percent of the population could it could do that successfully literally 70 percent of people who are trying to do that are not going to be successful because the genetics aren't with them on it mm. right like if you're a night owl like me and you try to do that kind of shit are you kidding me like you're miserable like it affects your whole your whole idea behind self-help right changes that's not good yeah. we want like my idea is let's have more self-help <laughs> let's yeah. have more self-care let's have people really thinking about what they do hmm. so okay REM sleep is sort of like the is it is REM like would you consider that a like a deep phase of sleep because isn't there significant arousal actually when we're in REM so so here's what's interesting is there's significant brain activity during REM, but not necessarily arousal. So when we look at the stages of sleep, what we're now starting to uh, understand is the stages themselves have very particular functions for us uh, for, during our waking state. So REM sleep, it, it appears as though has the biggest function is moving information from our short-term memory to our long-term memory. Mm. So that electrical process, right? Because it's just data that it's moving, right? So data comes in through your eyes, ears, nose, whatever. It, during stage three, four sleep, you filter. This is the shit I want to keep. This is what I want to get rid of. So when the keep stuff, when you hit REM sleep, it grabs that and it then puts it into store and you know, like into your hard drive, mm. right? So the process of doing that is all electrical or electro, electro neurochemical. And that whole process, as that's occurring, your brain has to figure out, well, what does that mean? Because there's all this kind of electricity floating around. So it interprets it in kind of a fantastical way, which are your dreams, right? And so there's a tremendous amount of brain activity, but yet 
when you look at depth of sleep, I would argue that REM is probably one of the deepest hmm. stages of sleep, but yet arousals, not necessarily, but activity, you bet, hmm. right? Whereas stage three, four sleep, that's all your physical restoration. Right, so and that's really front loaded. So that's actually in the beginning of the night, which kind of makes sense from a mother nature standpoint, right? Because if like if you if a saber toothed tiger was coming into your cave where you're sleeping after three hours, you want your body to have been physically restored enough to get the heck out of there. Right. So I get why that part seems to be going on. Probably because it's like a more it's more oriented to survival. Like right. you know, like yeah. you gotta take care of the body before you take care of the brain. Exactly the what brain, I'm saying. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, when we lay sleep out and we start to really understand what happens when you don't get certain stages, and then when you get more of other stages, it it can actually be very enlightening. Wow, is is that in the beginning part of the of the night when you first go to sleep? Isn't that when you mm -hmm. when you initially when you first get those really important hormonal pulses like testosterone? Growth, growth. hormone is the biggest, and that's what's that's the hallmark of stage three, four sleep, mm -hmm. right? And so when growth hormone hits, growth hormone it's like the holy grail of anti aging. It's like what everybody wants because growth hormone fixes it. Right, it's true cellular repair occurs during when growth hormone is emitted, and it's only emitted um, in large boluses during stage three, four sleep. So here's what's always so fascinating to me is people are always saying, you know, I, I want to get less sleep, I want to get less sleep. Uh, okay, I'm okay with that, but what you really want is you want to think not in about the quantity of sleep, you want to think about sleep quality, right? And if you can improve your sleep quality, which I would argue there are definitely ways that you can do that because that's what I do. I'm a high performance sleep coach. Right, so I don't. I no longer treat like apnea and narcolepsy. Like I take people who are of you know high net wealth and celebrity types, and they say, Michael, I want to perform at my highest level, and I only want to get six hours of sleep. Like that's what we do. Jeez, six hours. So what do you say when your clients say say something like that? It's it's possible. Interesting. With six hours, absolutely. Wow. But it, does it depend on the person, or yeah, is that course. something you can like train your body to? A little bit of both, huh. right? So one of the so here's one of the things that's so fascinating. Getting back to the book is when when I so let's so let's say you and I start working together. The very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out what your chronotype is, and then I'm going to change your bedtime, hmm. and I'm going to make it the chronotypical bedtime. Guess what happens when you do that for 21 days? Your time starts to shrink because your brain has now recognized, oh, this dumb body of mine is actually doing what I need it to do. Wow. So it, it, it can pred reliably predict when to start melatonin, when to turn it off. That makes the entire system more efficient. Hmm. As the system becomes more, because part of the reason why you have stage two sleep is because your cir circadian rhythm for REM is spread out a little bit further back than your circadian rhythm for deep. So if you can get out some of the middle, it can be it makes sense. I'm not suggesting that you eliminate it. I'm suggesting that when you sleep during what is your chronotypical bedtime, naturally it just shrinks because that's what it did for me. Wow. I sleep six hours and 13 minutes and I'm the freaking sleep doctor, <laughs> right? You know, uh, how do I do that? My consistency in my bedtime, I go to bed at midnight every single night. I'm a night owl. That's just, that's my time. It works perfect for me. I used to sleep until 7.30 every morning without an alarm. I literally wake up at 6.13 every single day. Wow, that's super interesting. And it just, it just creeps back. It just gives me more morning. Would you say that, that that going to bed at a consistent time is one of the keys to optimizing sleep quality? It's the anchor. Wow. It is the, if you want to learn one thing from me, it's wake up time that keeping that consistent will actually change just about everything. Hmm. The whole the whole system really needs, it needs the solidity of that anchor in order for it to have something to latch onto so then everything else just kind of knows when to go. Wow, so walk me through the different phases. So we, we've talked mm -hmm. about uh, stage three and four. Right. But is that slow wave sleep? That is, so that that's is. considered slow wave or deep sleep. So the only thing that's left to talk about really is stage one and stage two. And to be fair, stage one is a transitional stage. It makes up maybe 2%, so it's really not that big of a deal. Stage two is where we actually can make some headway. Hmm. So with stage two, what we know is that there is some things that have to do with memorial function in there. There's some things that have to do with overall levels of energy in there. But to be truthful, it, it can compact upon itself. And so when I work with clients that you tell me, oh, I have to get, you know, eight and a half, nine hours just to feel, you know, like I can function. Once we get them sleeping during their chronotypical bedtimes, that begins to shrink. And when we're monitoring their sleep, because I monitor their sleep during the whole process, what we, what we see happens to be shrinking is stage two. Wow. And that's natural. Like we're not, we're not adding anything to make that happen. Are there ways for, okay, so... I have a question, but before I get to that question, I want to know your thoughts, and I can share my, my take on them, but mm -hmm. 
What do you feel about uh, sleep tracking devices? <laughs> So I have one on right now. As okay, we're is that the Aura? It is. It's Got the it. Aura Ring. Nice. Um, so here's what I can tell you about sleep tracking devices. Sleep is a difficult metric, right? And so steps were easy, right? My daughter, who's 16, can. That's a calculus problem, right? Just the, your gait, the length of your leg, your swing, and you've figured out how many steps you need to take in a day. Hmm. Sleep is very, very complicated because if I say to you, "How did you sleep last night?" on a scale of one to what? Is it 10? Is it 100? Who the hell knows? And then what do you measure becomes the biggest question. How quickly you fell asleep? How much deep sleep did you get? How much REM sleep? How many awakenings? How long were the awakenings? You get the point. So unfortunately, most of the companies that have developed sleep monitoring systems weren't sleep companies. They were tracking companies. So there, there really wasn't a tremendous amount of forethought put into how do you create or understand this metric from a sleep clinician standpoint. So we're finally starting to see some of that happening. Um, I, full disclosure, um, I like the Aura Ring quite a bit. I use it with my patients for two or three simple reasons. One is the form factor. They stick it on, they have to, they don't think about it. They have to charge it once every three days. It's easy. You know, when I was using, um, for example, the Apple Watch, you have to take it off and you have to charge it. It's a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. So like it, from a convenience standpoint, I like that. Um, collecting data from the finger actually has some significant advantages because you can get temperature. You can also get heart rate variability. And so we all know heart rate variability has turned out to be a really interesting metric for a lot of reasons from overall health standpoints. So you can get sleep, you can get heart rate variability. There's some good stuff in here. Um, but to be fair, it's not 100% accurate. It's not even close, right? I mean, I would, I mean, first of all, remember, there's night to night variability in sleep. I mean, if, even if I put you in a sleep lab every single night for 30 days, 85% of the time your days would, would make sense. But 15% of the time your days would be wildly different, you know? And so it, it's just, that's how sleep works is it's not this easy thing to necessarily, necessarily categorize. So I, I would argue that this is kind of the best of the worst in some cases. Um, all of them are reasonable, but believe it or not, now there's this new thing called orthosomnia. Hmm. So there are people who are getting so tweaked out by their results from these things that they can't sleep. Wow, it's almost like orthorexia, <laughs> right? But it's like the the sleep anxiety version. Exactly. Wow, that's super interesting. It's, you know, <laughs> people are crazy. So, so, <laughs> so the reason why I ask about that is because a lot of people have asked me just over the years how mm -hmm. to boost. You know, they've they've read on their they've seen on their sleep tracker that you know they're they're not getting enough REM sleep or they're not getting enough mm -hmm. slow wave sleep so how much like stock would you put into ah yes into how do you read the the disparate data is the real question here right well how do you read it and then also is there what any meaningful way to like <laughs> to micromanage, you know, the yeah. amount of time that you spend in REM uh -huh. versus slow wave. Yeah, yeah. If you're Michael Bruce and you know how to do that, absolutely. <laughs> wow. But to be really super honest with you, that's one of the biggest problems with the tracking industry. Nobody knows what to do with the data. First of all, the accuracy is a problem. And then the secondary function is, well, what does it mean? Right? Like, okay, I get 13 minutes of REM sleep every night. Is that good? Is it bad? Here's what I'm going to tell everybody out there that's tracking anything is don't look at the absolute data. Look at the relative data. So if, it, if there, one night it says 13 minutes, don't go into a panic. If it says that 13 minutes every night, guess what? You're fine, <laughs> right? Because at the end of the day, there's no way you're only getting 13 minutes of sleep, but it's consistently being inaccurate. It's when you have 13 minutes one night and 407 minutes the next and 38 the, the next. That's when you want to kind of start to understand what's going on. Hmm. So I'm always looking at relative data and, and you take averages, right? You never look at just one point of data. I know lots of people, they look at, they wake up in the morning, they check their score. Bad idea, okay? Check your score on Sundays if that's what you, if, if you're really dying to know, right? Um, trust me, you'll be, you'll be okay with it. The other reason for me that I like the Aura Ring, the third one, is we ha I, they have an open API built in with my, for my patients. And so I can actually monitor my people you know, from far away if I need to. So I can actually give them on-the-fly sleep, sleep data Wow. You know, if they need it. That's amazing. So then how would you say you know, somebody out there is wanting to improve or, or, or lengthen the amount of time spent in slow wave sleep? Slow wave sleep we know. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you can you can speak to this very well about, uh, you know, the glim it's when the glymphatic system. system. Yeah, it pulls all that other crap out of there. We want that. We, we're dying for the, it's like the waste management of the brain finally comes in and pulls all that crap out, right? Amazing. Yeah, so, so how do we improve that, right? And that whole kind of idea. So easiest way to improve slow wave sleep 
is exercise. The most positive way is daily cardiovascular exercise. So one of the things that's been going on during this whole quarantine insanity is people aren't moving. Um, I had a celebrity the other day, they texted and they were like, I've had 200 steps and it's two o'clock. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, you know, like you'd be at like 8,000 by two o'clock, you know, on a normal day. So like people aren't moving. And so that lack of, remember sleep is all about recovery. And so the reason we need recovery is because we have moved. So you need to move in order to sleep better. So you need to get that back into your whole, you know, regimen. And that's one of the easiest, easiest ways to improve sleep quality. Um, the other is the elimination of caffeine and alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, not a big surprise there. Uh, to be fair, I like both of them. So managing those and, and mitigating that risk in a, in a unique way can actually be very effective, right? So none of my clients turn to me and say, oh, I, I never want to have alcohol again, or I never want to have caffeine again. So what we've come up with is a set of rules, which I'm happy to share. So the first one we know is that um, based on your circadian rhythm, and this is going to differ based on whatever your chronotype is, 90 minutes after you're supposed to wake up based on your chronotype, that's when you should have your caffeine. Hmm. The reasoning is, is because cortisol and adrenaline have boosted you up to wake you up in the morning. And so when you have that, those two things functioning in your brain, adding caffeine does almost no good because it's cortisol and adrenaline are like cocaine compared to, you know, like <laughs> caffeine, which is like weak tea, wow. right? In terms of just how powerful they are towards the brain, you got to let that simmer down before you add the caffeine on it. Otherwise, it's just not going to do you a whole lot of good. Is there any harm that can come from like pouring caffeine into that milieu? So not any harm per se, but what ends up happening is people are like, well, nothing worked. Wow. And so then they, they add another shot and then they add, you know, and then they're getting their four shot espresso or their six shot or whatever. If they literally just waited, then they'd, they'd get all the boost that they're looking for. And then what ends up happening sometimes is if they exacerbate the caffeine is they get all the, you know, the bad side effects. So they get the jitters or yeah. things like that. I feel like, so you're saying wait 90 minutes after you wake up? 90 minutes after you open your eyes. If I, you're waking up on your chronotypical wake up time, got it. that's when it works. That's like, that's the magic number. And then caffeine has a half-life of between six and eight hours. So most people don't think about it that way, but it does. And so my guesstimate is around two o'clock in the afternoon is a good cutoff time, hmm. right? Because then you're, it, most people, at least here in North America, go to bed somewhere around 10, 11. So eight hours later, half of it's out of your system. You know, it, it shouldn't prevent you from sleeping. Now, I guarantee you there's people who are listening and they're going to be like, huh, sleep doctor. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I can have a cup of coffee, a dinner, or espresso, cappuccino, and I can go right to bed. So let's be clear, there are different caffeine sensitivities. That's something that we learned probably about eight or nine years ago now is different people react differently to caffeine. But I'm going to tell you something. I dare you <laughs> to do this because here's what's going to happen is you might be able to fall asleep, but the quality of the sleep you're getting is going to be pure crap, hmm. right? If I stuck electrodes on your head right after you had a cup of coffee and had you go to sleep, Caffeine's a stimulant. It doesn't matter how you slice it. That's how it acts in the brain. So the closer to bedtime that you drink caffeine, the worse your slow wave sleep is, hmm. right? Because you're, it, it's, you're moving too fast to be slow, <laughs> right? Is the easiest way to think about it. Caffeine's a stimulant. Slow wave sleep, it's called slow wave for a reason. The waves are slow. Hmm. So like drinking caffeine too late in the day could actually, you're saying theoretically, impair how well your brain is able to clean itself of these plaques that accumulate. Oh, I don't think there's any theoretical about it. I would say absolutely that's wow. true. Wow. I would say that's the case. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's frightening. Depending upon the amount of caffeine, of course, and your tolerance level and things of that nature. Yeah. And I mean, your your internal microbiome is obviously going to have something to do with it. But um, yeah, I, I think there's absolutely, I don't think there's any question about whether or not there's an influence. I think the question would be if it's the sole influence. Or not. Yeah, yeah. I would argue probably not. Um, wow, super interesting. Um, so it's funny because like, when I wake up, I love to just go to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I drink a glass of water. Good, you should. And I then go right for the coffee <laughs> <laughs> like like well, at least you're drinking the water you know why do you feel like you just wanted to have something to help you open up uh I, for the, for, in terms of the caffeine well here's the thing i actually i routinely take breaks from caffeine um mm. i think it's important to not be yeah. dependent on it for sure um but when i am drinking caffeine i tend to drink it you know maybe like 10 50, uh, 20 minutes just to be generous 20 30 minutes after i wake up mm -hmm. um definitely not 90 minutes 
But uh, but I think probably I do that more for just the ritual of it. Like, you know, mm-hmm. just like you, you wake up, you go downstairs. It's the, it's the best part of waking up, yeah, right? Right, it's Folgers in your cup. <laughs> yeah. So so my morning ritual, I, so I had a similar ritual that you did. I mean, I think a lot of us do, right? You know, we're kind of used to that whole idea. So here's the, let me give you the science, right? I already told you the science on caffeine. Now I'm going to tell you the science on the, the cheapest way to wake up. It's called sunlight. Right. And so here's the deal is when the sun hits your eye, there's a special cell in your eye called a melanopsin cell. When the blue light from the sun hits your eye, it turns that shit off. It turns off the melatonin. You wake up. So what I'd rather see people do is grab that water because that's absolutely what you want to do. Most people don't know sleep is a dehydrative event. Hmm. Um, You lose almost a full liter of water from the humidity in your breath. Wow. From sleeping all night long. So wow. you're dehydrated when you wake up, which is another reason you shouldn't have caffeine because caffeine's a diuretic, <laughs> you know? So you already have a dehydrated system. You're going to add a diuretic to that. That's not a smart idea. Hmm. I'd rather see you hydrate, get some sunlight, breathe some fresh air. I promise you, you do that, you know, seven to 15 mornings in a row, you will feel significantly better. And you won't, you probably won't even want that caffeine. If you do, if you just wait that 90 minutes, you'll, you'll be surprised at how much more you'll enjoy it. Wow. How, why is it that some people, um, I was talking to my, my little brother about this, uh, and he was, he shared this anecdote that, you know, when he sleeps a good eight hours, he feels great. When he undersleeps, he feels like crap. If you have to, if he has to wake up unnaturally early, mm-hmm. but counterintuitively, he also feels like crap if he sleeps too much. Right. So it's fascinating. So there's a lot of interesting things that have been done with sleep deprivation over the years and trying to understand that whole idea. So we used to think of it as, a, we called it the sleep debt, right? So there you had a bank, you pulled out eight hours and whatever you put back and what was ever left was your debt, right? Well, so now that, that idea doesn't work so great because we don't always pull out eight hours, n- nor should we, right? So during different stages of our life, during different medical situations, if we're on certain medications, stress, blah, 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 we're going to have different amounts. So it's really hard to kind of metric it that way. Um, but when we start to think about amounts of sleep, our, the consistency thing, I know I'm beating this horse to death, but I'm promise you guys this. I've never seen anything work as well as consistent wake up time because what it does is it just channels everything into it and you can't oversleep, right? So, you know, you're saying your brother was saying to you, well, I feel like crap if I sleep too much. Your bo- My body doesn't let me do it. Mm. Like it just, I'm up like, and it drives me a little crazy to be really, to be really honest with you because I'm always like, if I open my eyes, it's going to be somewhere between 6, you know, 09 and 623. It's always right on like 613, 614. It's spooky, right? And it drives me crazy, but it's like, that's my brain's time. And it's really helpful because guess what? I'm the only one up in the house. I can do whatever I want. I can read, I can meditate, I can go outside and breathe. I can catch up on like the football scores from the night before. Like, you know, I can read about whatever I want to read about. Like, it's perfect for me. You'd be surprised that you, you capture these times that can be pretty valuable. Um, undersleeping, we, we all know a lot about undersleeping in terms of creating sleep deprivation. The big question is acute versus sustained, right? So acute is, do I pull an all-nighter? Um, sustained is, I've been losing like 90 minutes of sleep every night for the last 12 years. Michael, what do I do, right? So our bodies will will absorb a decent amount of that. Again, if I can get you into your chronotypical um, sleep schedule, your body just knows what to do there. And it, it, it's, it's literally like, um, it's like a superpower. It's like you can plug into this like energy and all of a sudden it just clicks in and makes everything work better. Mm. So, I mean, that's, that's really always the goal is, and part of the reason it feels worse when you don't sleep enough is because you're not in your chronotypical schedule. And then when you sleep too much again, you're not in your schedule. Wow. It's so great to hear you talk about these chronotypes because I've always felt somewhat guilty about being a, being a night owl and not loving waking up at Five in the morning, right. like some of my oh, more, more productive friends. Dude, uh, you, me, and Dave Asprey, right? So <laughs> Dave says this to me all the time. He's like, thank God you started telling people about wolves, Michael, because I'm because he's one. Here's You know what's fascinating? Most of my artists, most of my, my real creators are night owls, right? So artists, actors, um, authors, um, lots and lots of these people, I mean, they're – We're night creatures, you know, like that's just, that's when my ideas come. That's when I'm the most creative. That's when I'm the most thoughtful. Um, And that's okay. As long as you know it, (laughs) then you can work with it. Super interesting. So what about ways of boosting REM, REM sleep? So boosting REM sleep has, has, um, 
number one, sleep in your chronotypical bedtime um, because you'll it'll naturally allow that to occur. Um, number two is it actually has a lot to do with um, doing things to maintain a solid sleep schedule. So um, trying to avoid things that could be waking you up throughout the night. So mm. things like having to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night or things like having too much caffeine on board. Caffeine just pretty much destroys all of it. Wow. Um, Cannabis can definitely have an effect on REM sleep. And so for folks out there who are daily users of cannabis or evening users of cannabis, one of the things we know is continuous use of high levels of THC will definitely start to bring REM sleep down. Now, here's the interesting argument because people are always saying things to me like, well, you know, how can you support the idea of cannabis for sleep, Dr. Bruce, if it lowers REM sleep? And so here's my re you know response to that. Every single SSRI, Prozac, Zoloft, Evixor, uh, Ephbilify, every single one of them almost completely knocks out REM sleep. Hmm. Almost completely. People have been on those drugs for 30 years, right, without any appreciable REM sleep. A little bit of cannabis, <laughs> it doesn't knock it out. All it does is it lowers it down. And I would argue that when you start to look at it and there are different isomers of THC, there's definitely a way to figure out how to get THC that doesn't you know, have a tremendous effect on REM sleep. And to be fair, the thing you're really looking for is CBN. Um, CBN is the constituent within cannabis that actually has the most data surrounding uh, positivity for sleep. That's super interesting. So within the cannabis plant, you've got THC, which is psychoactive. It's what right. makes you high. Then you've got CBD, which mm -hmm. is, you know, it's been used clinically for a number of decades to treat certain seizure disorders, things mm -hmm. like that. It's now in, you know, I mean, you can find it anywhere. Unfortunately, it's on in any on anything and in everything. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it in sparkling waters. Oh, dude, somebody tried to ask. They asked me if I would promote a pillow that was soaked in CBD. It's got to drive you a little crazy. It does drive me a lot crazy. Yeah. So just to be clear, if you're looking to use CBD for sleep, it's not going to be your friend. Huh. You're talking about almost 200 milligrams before we see any real what we call soporific or uh, insomniac effect. So you're saying it's just that the dose tends to be low in CBD products, too low. To, you'd have to use almost a full bottle wow. in most cases. Now, if you had CBN, ugh, completely different story. Hmm. Um, and a lot of people are discussing the idea of you know CBN with a, little, with a small amount of THC, so THC kind of lowers that anxiety. CBN helps the natural sleep process. So, I mean, there's ways to think about this that I think are interesting, right? And and look, at the end of the day, we're not that far off from this. Yeah, super. I've never heard of CBN. Oh, I've written about it quite a bit. Wow. If, and if people are interested in, in you know, cannabis and sleep, um, go to my blog, uh, it's thesleepdoctor.com forward slash blogs. And um, just type in cannabis. I've written extensively, probably eight or nine, you know, 2,000 word blogs. Any other, any other supplements that you're a fan of in terms of sleep? You know, here's what I tell you I'm a big fan of is making sure that our bodies have what it's supposed to have. Hmm. So I don't start with supplements. I start with vitamins and minerals. So I'm a big fan of vitamin D. I'm a big fan of magnesium. I'm a big fan of iron and I'm a big fan of melatonin. So my goal is to make sure that all of these things are at the right levels for my individual. So when I, again, have like one of these people who I come in and do the coaching with, the very first thing we do is I work with their MD doctors and I say, let's do, let's run blood work and these are the things I want to look at. Hmm. So I look for deficiencies. Guess what? Most people are deficient in magnesium and vitamin D. So I'm almost always starting those out first and we start to see almost immediate gains um, in the sleep department from having those on board Wow! Um, very, very quickly. If, and especially in my female clients, if we discover that they're uh, iron deficient, um, iron has a lot to do with the sleep cycle as well, so that can be very helpful. Um, and then some people who complain of restlessness in sleep, we've now discovered that a, a, de a deficiency in something called ferritin, which is a type of iron, uh, causes almost feels like restless leg syndrome. And so we can knock that out with just iron sulfate. Like it's super easy. So I check all those types of things. Like I want the body to be working the way the body is supposed to first. Yeah. Before we start introducing new ideas and herbs and things like that. Um, as far as melatonin is concerned, 90% of people have got enough melatonin in them and they're and it's going just fine. So remember melatonin is a hormone, even though you can buy it at the local health food store, which you probably shouldn't be able to do. Um, it's by prescription only in Europe. Many people don't even know that. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, so so what, what's interesting about melatonin is it's a hormone, right? People are giving it to their kids. I don't like that idea. Yeah, I've heard that that's not smart. 
No, I've got a 16 year old daughter. She's never had melatonin. Guess why? She doesn't need it. Yeah. Um, 99% of children don't need melatonin. They create a tremendous amount of it. It's actually one of the biggest hormones that's produced during those adolescent years. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's necessary. I will tell you this. There is one uh, subset of children that melatonin works very well in and is necessary, and that's kids on the spectrum, on the autism spectrum. So across that spectrum, we've seen really good results with uh, three and five milligrams, sometimes six or eight milligram dosages for those kids at night. But that's the only group, uh, that's my big caveat, is that's the only group of kids that I've actually seen data um, that I trust that, it, that melatonin is a good idea for children. Um, also, we see melatonin can be helpful for people like age 50, 55 and up. So I'm 52, so I'm kind of starting to get into that range. Mm. But we know that melatonin production begins to decline then. And so sometimes that can change your chronotype, right? And so I might go from being a night owl to being a bear, you know, in the middle. I might go from being a wolf to a bear because my melatonin is now moving at a different, you know, time period because of my age. So on occasion, we do have some uh, patients who would prefer their old chronotype chronotype so they can stay on a melatonin supplement. Interesting. I, I had a, 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 a doctor of a naturopathic doctor on the podcast and he, mm -hmm. he said something about uh, melatonin that I thought was really interesting for uh, shift workers, you know? Yeah. So shift work is a whole different ball game. And like there's shift work medicine is like a whole unique subspecialty. Mm -hmm. um, and I've worked in those arenas before. I'm a fan of melatonin for those people because you're basically forcing your circadian rhythm out of whack. Yeah. Now, to be fair, what they really should do is they should screen people and say, hey, all you night owls, come work the late shift, right? That would make intuitive sense, right? Genetically. But the problem is the reason that that doesn't work that way is because you get time and a half or double time working the night shift. So a lot of people like to work the night shift because the dollars are better. Pays more. Right. You know, and so they don't realize what a toll it takes on your health. If you're not one of those people who's like me, a night owl, or it sounds like you, a night owl, and you're working the night shift, I mean, the increase in suicide, the increase in mental health problems, the increase in high blood pressure, I mean, it's, it's astounding, wow. right? I mean, it's just, it's there. But I mean, melatonin use in those populations makes sense. Also, light therapy makes sense for them too, right? Because light therapy helps suppress the melatonin, and then you add the melatonin when you need it back. Yeah, super interesting. Um, the light therapy thing, I think, is is uh, well, light in general is so important. Yeah. Um, are you a fan of like red light? I am. Photobiomodulation, any of that I stuff. Am. I am. So you know, from a from an inflammation standpoint, I think there's some really interesting data on it. As far as sleep is concerned, we have not seen a tremendous amount of data in the sleep universe with red light and sleep as of yet. What we have seen is that red light is good because there's no blue light, um, and so uh, by by you know pushing all the blue light out with having such a red universe that that works right so that you could say that it's helpful is it is it in addition i don't know yeah right um but i think science is going to bear that out i mean there are a lot of companies out there that are starting to look at that i can tell you that you know blue light in the morning is highly effective for things like seasonal affective disorder for um being able to you know move shift workers around a jet lag in particular so we do a lot of work with jet lag um and I, so some of my clients come to see me only for uh, jet lag as a matter of fact. So it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Wow. Yeah. Uh, there's just there, man, sleep is, it's so, it's so crucially important. Um, and it's, it's just one of those things that like, yeah, by, by trying to cut corners with sleep, you really are like undermining everything, everything, literally everything, dude. It's like everything you do, you do better with a good night's sleep. I mean, every organ system, every disease state is affected by sleep. I mean, the good ones and the bad ones, right? So cancer is a perfect example. We now know that we can deliver chemotherapy at particular times in a person's circadian cycle. Mm. We can use less chemo and it's more effective. Dude, less poison, yeah. more progress only by just administering this at a different time in your circadian cycle. I mean, it's called chronotherapeutics. Like I'm working with a company and we're developing apps for physicians to be able to know and understand when to do this. Like Sloan Kettering's already starting to adopt some of these um, some of these protocols. It's it's fascinating. Wow, like literally giving people chemo in accordance with their 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 chronotypes. Wow. Yeah. That's dude. amazing. Yeah. I mean, saving people's lives. That's what we that's the goal, right? <laughs> yeah. Jesus. What can people do um so like how militant are you about uh, the light that enters your eyes in the evening? Like, you know, I'll tell you I, pros and cons in either direction. Right. So I have full disclosure. I've got my own line of blue light blocking glasses. Um, I did that because my kids are gamers and I couldn't find any 
glasses that they liked enough to be willing to wear them, mm. right? And so there's a lot of different glasses that are on the marketplace and some of them are amazing. And I mean, they can knock out 100% of the blue light, but the problem is you almost can't see anything, right? And so my kids were like, we're not gonna wear those, dad, because we can't see the screen. So yeah. you need to figure this. And so we found ones that really block a preponderance of the light. Um, and the reason they do is because they're of that amber shade. Mm. So what you're seeing now in the marketplace is there's been a commoditization, right? So everybody's going to the lowest price and they, everybody wants clear blue light blocking glasses. So the thing that nobody's telling anybody is it's not just about blocking the wavelength, but it's also about blocking the brightness. And that's what the amber coating does is it blocks the brightness. So if you want them to work, you got to have amber glasses. Yeah. Like the, the clear <laughs> blue blocking glasses to me never made any sense. They don't do shit. Yeah. Because blue, you're still seeing blue. You are. Yeah. Super, yeah, I, I definitely enjoy wearing them. Um, I feel great when I wear them. Yeah, I put them on like 90 minutes before bed, yeah. depending upon what I'm doing, Yeah, right? You know, if I'm, ha I'm going to have a light source in front of me where I'm, you know, looking at, you know, Facebook or whatever, then yeah, I probably should have them on. But if I'm watching TV from across the room, eh, I might, I might not. It just depends. You know, it would, be, it would be amazing if TV manufacturers built in night shift into TVs. <sighs> right, so here's the problem with that is night shift doesn't really work. Huh. Yeah, so there was a study out of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute where they took night shift and they actually measured melatonin production uh, for using it and not using it, it had zero effect. No effect. No effect. So it's night shift is like if you, night shift is bullshit for like the Samsung users. I guess night shift is like the it's a feature on your on your iPhone that mm -hmm. basically the screen oh, becomes, right. the screen becomes increasingly orange as the right. as it becomes you know dark right. outside. So the reason that it doesn't work very well is because what you're talking about is something called color temperature. So color temperature is a you can change. So to be clear, there is a free application called Flux F L U X. You can download F L U X. You can download it to your laptop and it will, it's for free. They're, these guys are awesome. They're like true light scientists. Like they're totally down. They're the lightest geeks you could possibly imagine, but mm. they're awesome. And you put this on your computer and it will slow down. It will actually change what's called the color temperature as opposed to just the brightness. So it's, it's I, for folks who might remember this, it's the difference between turning the volume up and down and changing the, the treble and the bass, mm. right? Wow. What are some things that people can do in... You know, aside from the glasses in the immediate, you know, one to two mm -hmm. to three hours before going to sleep sure. uh, that are going to help with sleep quality. So, I mean, the, it depends upon like who you are as a human and sort of what has to happen for you. So like if you've got young kids that that might take up a tremendous amount of your time, energy and, and stuff. But if you're if you don't or, or you you know, let's say because the three hours before bed, that's a big line, chunk of time. So let's say the hour, hour before bed. Right. So what I did was I created a technique I call the power down hour. Right. So here's the thing that people don't realize is sleep's not an on off switch. You need you need some runway, right, to kind of land that plane. And so what I've discovered is if I take the hour before bed and I chop it up into three 20 minute segments. So 20 minutes for just shit I got to do, right? So it might be send that last email. Um, it might be, you know, find sports equipment for my kids, to, <laughs> you know, for the next day. Um, 20 minutes for hygiene. Um, so, you know, brush your teeth, wash your face, take a hot shower or bath, whatever it is you do. And then 20 minutes for some form of meditation, relaxation, prayer, like whatever gets you there, right? And so remember, the biggest metric that's important for falling asleep is heart rate. Your heart rate needs to be at 60 or below, period. Mm. That's how it works. <laughs> I was I had a, a girlfriend once and uh, she you only had one girlfriend. No, well, no, I had one <laughs> girlfriend in particular and it, it was a very long term on and off again relationship. But one thing that she always brought up to me, which I thought was so funny mm. when we were like in our 20s, she. Uh, sex raises your heart rate, right? Yeah. So once I just remember it was like after an event and I was like exhausted. I was right. like, I just could not wait to get to sleep. Right. And we're in bed and she was in the mood. Right. And I remember you know, first of all, you should never look a gift horse in the in the in the mouth when somebody <laughs> is trying to have sex with you. You should have sex. You should have sex. But I, you know, I can be selfish, and if it's consensual, if it's yeah. Um, but I rem I said to her, and she remembered it. She she has always remembered it, and I, for good reason. I was like, oh, I don't want to raise my heart rate right now. <laughs> 
That's and, hilarious. Yeah. So there's so there's she, old, she never let me live it down, by the way. Yeah, I'm sure. So here's what's interesting about sex before sleep is it's different for uh, male versus female. So it's not a big surprise that a lot of women complain, oh my God, he falls asleep after, you know, we have sex all the time, you know, and I'm up and, you know, around. Actually, that's hormonally accurate. So what we think is going on here is when testosterone mixes with orexin, which is like that love cuddle hormone, which happens usually after orgasm, that seems to cause a soporific or a sedative effect. When it combines with estrogen, it does the opposite. It makes them actually have more energy. So mm. the truth of the matter is, is you'd have been better having sex and then just fallen asleep immediately, but she would have been up for, you know, an extended period of time. Wow. So wait, so for men, sex before bed makes them sleepy, makes them sleepy. For women, it makes them honestly want to just get up and go do something. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. So, but what's interesting is when you look at what's the perfect time for sex, um, it, it's actually not even what you would might imagine, right? And so it, it used to be not tonight I have a headache. Now, honestly, it's like not tonight I'm too freaking exhausted, right? People are so tired and they're trying to figure this whole thing out. So, but when you look at it hormonally, it's very fascinating. So you need five hormones to have successful sex. You need estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, adrenaline, and cortisol. And they all need to be high. Hmm. And you need melatonin to be low, right? Makes sense, right? Energy hormones, sleep hormones, high, low, right? I'll give you one guess what your hormone profile looks like at 10 30 at night uh probably not conducive not super conducive it's literally sex. it's literally the opposite right of what you would want to have happen. when's the best time of day to have sex so what's interesting is 74 percent of people have sex somewhere between 10 30 and 11 30 at night we actually did a survey it's quite fascinating work um and so what we discovered is is that their hormone profile is off at night so that's clue number one mm. as to when should people be having sex uh, number two what do most men wake up with uh, erection. An erection, yeah. right? And so if that's not Mother Nature telling you when to use that thing, I'm really not sure what is. That's amazing. So guess what? All your testosterone is high after REM sleep, which is what you have at the back half of the night. So guess what? If you get a good night's sleep, you should be active in the morning. Morning sex is probably the best sex you could have. Not only from a performance standpoint, like not only from a physical, but also from like an emotional connection standpoint as well that's what the that's what the data would suggest and women seem to be more receptive to sex in the morning um than sex in the evenings and here's the funniest part of all the research men were like whenever <laughs> <laughs> like whenever it was offered men were like yes um but women were much more receptive to sex in the morning and then it turns out that it's based on your chronotype too right so this is where it got really interesting so the book i actually had to create a matrix so i've got like chronotype on one side and partner chronotype on the other and then we had to create a um a gay and a lesbian one because the hormones are different, hmm. right? So I have three different matrices. It's really cool. The science is awesome. Wow, that's so interesting. The, the morning sex thing is funny because it's like, yeah, it's like, you know. You got to brush it, your teeth. You got to brush your It just feels like your body has things that it needs to do before, you yeah, know, like you got to brush your teeth, not, you got to pee. Know. Just saying. But, uh, but that's really, that's good information. That is like, wow. Um, it's the number one question that I get asked by journalists. Best time to have sex? Yep. Wow. Number one. Um, how can we like any like performance hacks for like night sex? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't, I don't know if I've ever really thought through that as hmm. an idea. I mean, the biggest, you know, I mean, sex, I mean, it depends upon what aspect of sex you would want to hack. Right. So, I mean, if it was like, you know, sustaining, then you're looking at heart rate, right? That's because mm. it's all about heart rate and blood pressure. Because mm. that's where all the that's where all the learnings from tantra come from, right? Is this being able to keep a solid blood pressure, keep me a solid heart rate? That's really where and keeping that energy kind of at bay. That's really where the that's really where tantra gets most of its energy from. Wow. So I would argue that that'd probably be the same thing. But I don't I don't know anything about yeah, that. Like, that's, that's so not cool. My area of expertise. But so cool, man, um, dude. Well, it's been so fun to have you here. <laughs> I feel like we could keep talking for hours. Um, but uh, is this your last book, The Power of When? This is, yeah, this is the last book, The so, Power of When. But I got another one that's going to be not for a while. So maybe I'll come back when that one's coming that'd out. That'd be amazing, yeah. It's all going to be about energy. But it's cool because like we talked all about chronotypes and this is a great book to help you learn to figure out your chronotype, right? Absolutely. So you can go to chronoquiz.com and um, you can figure out what your chronotype is. You don't even have to buy the book. But if you buy the book, you can learn about the best time to have sex. Um, you can learn about the best time to ask your boss for a raise, to eat a cheeseburger to write a book, uh, to tell a joke. Uh, the data is really compelling and it's a lot of fun. Uh, we've discovered it's a great communication tool. Um, there's a chapter in there about when's the best time to talk to your kids. And um, it's been great. 
Like people, like I get a lot of letters from parents and they're like, oh, wow, my teenager is a night owl, right? Like if I talk to them at, you know, nine o'clock at night, I get very different responses than if I try to talk to them at eight o'clock in the morning. Hmm. Like it's really cool stuff. But and you, but as you mentioned, like chrono chronotypes change over time. Yeah, they do. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, I, I remember like as a teen, like my, just my parents not being able to understand why I needed so much sleep. And I was like... <laughs> I'm not like laying in bed for fun. Like I'm laying, you know, like. <laughs> so I'll give you the quintessential story that'll, that'll, it's a great, it's a great way for the, inter for the interview to end is my dad would come in at age 16 and he, I would be, it would be two o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday afternoon and I'd still be in bed and he'd be like, how are you ever going to make something of yourself by <laughs> sleeping all day? And now I'm the freaking sleep doctor, yeah. right? So it's like, ah, uh, you can kiss my butt, dad. <laughs> I have the same, same story with my parents. Uh, that's so funny. Well, where can listeners find you on social media? Yeah, I'm super easy to find, thesleepdoctor.com. Um, that's my handle is The Sleep Doctor. So Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Pinterest. I don't know, if, did I miss one? Twitter, there, it's all The Sleep Doctor. So please follow me. We do um, put out a lot of tips and hacks and things like that that are really fun on Instagram. So uh, you can hit me up on Instagram or Facebook. We do the same thing. That's awesome. And when people find you, it's like a cartoon avatar of you, right? <laughs> I do. We have a cartoon avatar. We have we have a lot of fun stuff. We, That's cool. Look, at the end of the day, we just want to educate people about better sleep and find really good products that really work for people and match them up. Yeah, I love that. So important. Um, the last question that gets asked to everybody on the show, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Bruce, what does it mean to you to live a genius life? Oh, what does it mean? Uh, I think to live a genius life would be to always be open to new ideas and energy, because I think that's really the only way that you continue to progress. Hmm. I love that. Short and sweet. Dude, well, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was fun. Yeah, of course. To all you guys, thank you for your time and attention as always. Text me to let me know what you thought about this episode of the show, 310-299-9401. Pick up Dr. Bruce's book, The Power of When, yeah. and uh, I'll catch you on the next episode. Peace. Yeah.